Well, here's yeah. the sea bird and the sea bass honey hole here. Oh, man, the a top top and a sea bass. <laughs> nice and gentle, let the knife roll off the bones. Now we're gonna give these a good dose of salt and pepper on both sides. Order up. Look at that. We're right where I want to be. Look kind of lively. We're in the rocks where the tog live. And there's a number of different jig head styles on the market. I like the ones that sit flat on the bottom with a hook up like that. This is what we call a banana style. It's got a swinging hook. It's all personal preference, but these are the ones that I like. I think this one's made by Johnny Jigs. All right. Dog fishing, your most common bait is going to be green, green crabs. So essentially you just want to go in one leg socket and back out through another. Net worthy, that's a nice sea bass. Nice. We'll take that. A decent sea bass for this time of year. We'll take it. Put oh, it deck off, it. Thank you, sir. Right now it's late August. Kind of feels weird tog fishing this time of year. Tog, yeah. I'm gonna say it's usually around Halloween when I'm out best tog fishing. Good size one too. Oh, Jason, that was pretty quick too. We wow. just just dropped down. Uh oh. Let me know if you need a net. Me too. <laughs> no net. Yeah, I got a sea bass. That's where after, huh? Sea bass. That's a nice sea bass. We'll take that. Nothing wrong with IC bass. Season's still open. So we have plenty of room. <laughs> if the season closes, what, next week on sea bass? Got something all good. Antoine, I think, uh, ooh. We might be crossed over, Antoine. Woo! Oh, here's yeah. the sea bird and the sea bass honey hole here. A talk and a sea bass. <laughs> That's a nice tog, too. Yeah, get in there. Get in there. All right, let's get the bubba net. Get the bubba net. Ha <laughs> ha! Double head of tog and a sea bass. <laughs> nice work, Antoine. Thank you, sir. The bolt good fish. Both keepers. Yeah. Both keepers. I like it. Yes! So the regulations are sea bass need to be 16 and a half inches and to tog are what, 16 Jason? 16, yes. And four fish on the sea bass, three fish on the to tog? At this time of the year, yes. And October 15th it goes to five. Oh my god. Let that guy go. Now we're fishing. Yes, sir. It's a good tog.
All right, we had a fun morning fishing yesterday on Little Sister Charters. Uh, my new friend Antoine managed to catch a nice tatog. He was nice enough to let me take that home. And today we're gonna be whipping up a classic fish chowder. Um, this is one of my all time favorite ways to use tatog. Tatog is a very firm texture, mild flavor, uh, but it really shines when it's braised or put in a stew or a chowder. It holds up very well, it's very firm. Um, and I first learned about this chowder recipe many years ago, and it was not from a chef, it wasn't from a cookbook, but all things, I learned this recipe from a photocopier repairman. The year was 1996, I had just graduated college, moved down to Cape Cod, uh, quickly discovered it's a very expensive place to live, so I went out and bought a quahog rake, started doing a lot of shell fishing. And my first job, I was working for a clothing company I worked in the art department and one of my chores was to make thousands upon thousands of coupons for the stores on this antiquated photocopier machine and about once a month this thing would break down, we'd have to have a guy come in and fix it, it was the same guy every time, super nice guy, and when he was done fixing the photocopier he would always make one test print to make sure everything was working okay and it had a lot of detailed artwork on it and there was also a recipe for New England clam chowder. So I got to thinking one day, I asked him, you know, have you ever tried this recipe for New England clam chowder that's on this test sheet? And he said, yeah, actually, it's really good. Um, but two things, he's like, I, add, I like to add a little bit of dill and a little bit of thyme. That really puts it over the top, which were not in the original recipe. So I tried it and lo and behold, it was a great recipe. I've been evolving this recipe for over 20 years now. Every time I make it, it's a little bit different. Um, it's changed a number of times. I've added some stuff to it. I've taken some stuff away But this is definitely a solid recipe for a classic New England fish chowder First step in making any good chowder is starting with a good stock. So that's where we're gonna start We've got our stock pot here. We have some gorgeous fish racks That we have from yesterday and I'd like to just use the tail section of the fish I don't use the heads. There's a lot of collagen in the bones and the fins so we're just going to add these to the stock pot. And I did make sure yesterday to give these a good cleaning. You don't want any blood in there. You want them as clean as possible. We're going to add some celery. Pretty much a crucial ingredient in any kind of stock. And another critical ingredient in the stock is onions. So these are the butts of the onions that we're going to be putting in the chowder. And last but not least, we're going to use two fresh bay leaves. A lot of people don't realize that you can grow bay yourself. It's actually a very easy plant to grow. Um, it's not cheap. That plant cost me about 20 bucks, but I've had it. This is my fourth year now. Um, it's pretty hardy. You just need to bring it inside in the winter, but one plant, you pretty much have fresh bay leaves for the year. So two fresh bay leaves in the pot. And we're gonna add about three cups of water to this. Just make sure everything's covered up with water. It's perfect. And we're just gonna bring that up to a boil. Once it's at a boil, we're gonna drop it down to a low simmer. This stock is gonna take about 35, 45 minutes. That should be done. Another crucial ingredient in a proper chowder is potatoes. So let's head out to my potato patch and dig up some taters. So what we have here doesn't look like much right now. These potato plants are all dying down. This is when you want to dig them up. Back in the heat of the summer, these were up about four, four and a half feet, um, but they're pretty sad looking right now. But at the base of each of these stems, hopefully we're going to find a big old clump of taters. Uh, this is the first time I've dug so far this year. So it's always kind of a mystery how your potatoes did from season to season, but we shall find out. And potatoes are actually one of the easiest things, I think, to grow. You start them in about mid-April, and you start with seed potatoes, which basically looks like a regular potato with eyes coming out of it. You cut those in half, bury them, and then you just wait. And it does help if you add soil on top of them. The more soil you add on top, the more potatoes you get. Oh, there's a nice one. Looks like a russet. I think I have five or six different varieties going in here. There's one. Get 
give these guys a good scrub. Usually I like using the red potatoes, which I do have out there, but really any kind of potato will work in a chatter. It's about as fresh as you're going to get for a potato. All right, our stock has reached a boil. Now we're gonna wanna reduce the heat to low, cover it, and we're gonna let this simmer for about a half an hour. Next, let's start with the fish. And this is kind of a new technique that I've only be re recently been gun doing, but I'm now wrapping all my fillets in paper towels. Uh, when I bring them home, I rinse them off, get all the blood, the guts off there, wrap them in paper towels. And what that does is it really takes a lot of the moisture out of the fish. I mean, these are really damp. If I'm storing them for more than a single day, I'll take the towels off, replace them, store them again. And it really just kind of condenses the fish. It prevents that you know bag of bloody fillets that develops after three or four days when fish has been in the fridge. Keeps them nice and dry. So now I'm just gonna trim these up. These fillets will have a row of pretty fierce bones right down the center of the fillet. They go back to about right here and they come all the way to the front of the filet. So we definitely do not want to serve a bowl of chowder that is riddled with pin bones. So I am going to cut those out. Basically we just make a V-notch like that and that should get all the bones out. Now the meat that had the bones in it is not going to go to waste. I'm going to add that to our stock pot. What do you like, sushi? Sushi? Oh dear lord, you're drooling all over the place. Sushi, oh good boy. Alright, we get the bones out of the fillets. Now I'm just going to cut these into manageable size pieces. Like so. Now we're going to give these a good dose of salt and pepper on both sides. Now this is a step for many years I didn't incorporate, but I think it's a really nice touch. If you had the time, you could certainly skip this step. But I am gonna roll these in flour. And since we put that salt down first, the salt's gonna draw moisture out of the fish and that's gonna help the flour stick to it a lot better. So now we're gonna pop our fish that's been dusted in flour into the refrigerator for about 15-20 minutes. And that's like I said, that's going to make the flour adhere to the fish a lot better. And while that's resting in there, I am going to preheat a cast iron skillet. And we're going to put that on medium heat for about 8-10 to 10 minutes. We want our skillet to be nice and hot and preheated when we put that fish into the skillet. All right, the next crucial ingredient in a proper fish chowder is bacon. Uh, we have two cups of diced bacon here. And this is going to start the whole chowder party off. And this is probably more bacon than we actually need. But I know I'm going to like nibble on a bunch of these little bacon bits before they make it into the chowder. So I always do a little extra. So we'll start this over high heat until it gets going, then we'll drop it down to medium low. We're just going to want to cook this bacon down until it gets nice and crispy. And we're actually going to use this at the very end and we're going to garnish the finished chowder with some nice crispy bacon bits, which are really going to put it over the top. All right, our skillet has been preheating for about eight minutes. You know when a cast iron skillet is ready to go, if you touch the handle, and you can't hold on to it, it's ready to go, and that is hot. You're gonna add probably a good tablespoon of olive oil. And this little nub of butter is probably a tablespoon and a half. Probably didn't need all that butter, but why not? Butter makes it better. Now we're going to add our fish in. We just want to get this just lightly browned in the pan. 
I do this for a couple of reasons. I like having that little bit of color on the fish. I like having that salt on the fish. So when you get a piece of fish, you get that. That's where the salt is coming from. And also this little bit of flour on here is gonna help thicken our chatter a bit. It's probably gonna take about three to four minutes to get these nicely browned. We're gonna brown both sides. We're not worried so much about cooking the fish all the way through because we are gonna be adding this back into a hot chatter. That's about what I'm looking right there. Just starting to turn a little bit golden brown. Once these pieces get golden on both sides, we're gonna remove them to paper towels. Mmm, bacon. We are going to remove this to a paper towel. Drain the grease. And spread that out, get the fat out. Good bacon. Now we're gonna drain this fat out of the pan. We're gonna reserve about a teaspoon of the fat, but there's way more than we need here. We don't want a big greasy chowder. All right, really the holy trinity for any proper chowder is having an equal amount of fish, onions, and potatoes. So we have our fish cooked, we can kind of gauge that. Now it's time to chop up our Onion. So we probably have about three cups of diced onion here. That's where I really like these Santuco style knives over a chef knife as they make getting stuff off the cutting board a little bit easier. So like I said, we're gonna want equal amounts of potato, diced onion and fish. The onions are gonna cook down substantially. It looks like a lot of onions now, but once those cook, they're gonna be re reduced by probably at least a half. So we're gonna turn our heat on about medium. We still get a little bit of that fat in the pan from the bacon, probably about a teaspoon or so. We're gonna add our onions and cook our onions down. And while the onions are cooking, we'll get our herbs ready. So let's go get some fresh thyme. Some gorgeous fresh thyme here. I actually use quite a bit of it. I'm going to want probably 10 to 12 sprigs. That's probably about the amount of thyme you're going to need for a proper chatter. And I like to season the chatter as I go along in various steps. So we're going to start just adding some fresh thyme into our onions. I just want to pull the leaves against the grain. From top to bottom, they come off a lot easier that way. And we're gonna add some fresh dill in here as well. You can just kind of pinch that up. We're probably putting in about a teaspoon of each right now. And I really think that's what makes this recipe so good, besides from the bacon, is the herb combination of dill and thyme really goes nice with a fish chatter. All right, time to strain the fish stock. Smells really good. going to add a little bit of salt to our onions. We don't want a lot of salt in there. We're going to salt this at the end. I'm going to add in just a little bit of this fish stock to the onions, help them soften. All right, time to cut our potatoes. I'm looking for about a quarter inch cube on these. And the other thing I like to do is take some of the potato and slice it up super thin, as small as I can get it. And that's gonna help thicken the chatter a bit. You really wanna slice it as thin as you possibly can. That'll break down pretty quickly. So this is not an exact measurement. I'm um, not very scientific, but that to me looks like about equal amounts potato to fish. As you can see, 
our onions are translucent. These are perfectly cooked down for a chatter, nice and soft. That's where we want them. You can see they did reduce down quite a bit. When they're at this point, it is time for the potatoes. Pat those down into the bottom of the pot. And now we want to add just enough fish stock to just barely cover all the potatoes. You still want to see a couple of those taters swimming above the surface. So that is the exact amount you want. Now we're going to turn the heat on high. We're going to bring this to a boil. And once this has come to a boil, we're going to cook it for exactly 12 minutes, at which point the potato should be soft. And at this point, we're going to add in one bay leaf because why not? We have achieved a boil. We are going to drop down to medium heat. We are going to cover the pot. And we are going to set a timer so we don't have soggy potatoes. And I'll start it at 11 minutes just to be on the safe side. Countdown. All right, our potatoes are perfect. I like to mash a few of them up in the side of the pan just to help thicken it. Give this a good stir. I'm going to hit it with a little bit more herbage, a little more time. Now it's time for the fish. I'm going to re Reduce the heat to low. Add the fish in. And I'm just going to break this up a little bit at this point. I don't want to totally mash it up, but cut each one of those big chunks into about thirds or so. We'll break the fish up further a little bit later in the process. So the longer this sits, the better it's going to get. I had the heat all the way on low. We're going to put the cover on it. And now it's time to make the roux. Some people like a really thick chowder. Some people like a really watery chowder. I'm somewhere in the middle. I like a little bit of thickness, but I don't want to be able to stick my spoon in there and have the spoon stand up. I find a lot of um, restaurants make their chowders way too thick. I think a lot of that is they just sit on a low burner for hours on end and they thicken up. But we're aiming at a medium consistency chowder. So to do that, we're gonna make a roux. A roux is always equal parts flour to butter. So I just kind of know from experience, I'm probably going to need about four tablespoons of butter to thicken this size pot of chowder. So we will start with half a stick of butter. want to stir this constantly. I want to make sure all that flour is blended well into the butter. We do not want clumps. We want it nice and smooth. Now once our roux begins to bubble like it is, she's ready to go. Now we are going to add, I'm using light cream. You could certainly use heavy cream if you have no fear of cholesterol. You could use milk if you really want to go on the light side. And we're going to want to add this in gradually. And you can see it's going to thicken up pretty quickly. So we're adding about a third of a cup at a time. Mix it in. It'll start getting lumpy. That's okay. It'll work its way out. And we're going to keep adding our dairy like this gradually, very slowly. 
get it on about medium low heat and we're gonna to wanna to bring this all the way up to a boil. And one of the other key ingredients to Mr. Photocopier Repairman's chowder from back in the day is evaporated milk. And you don't see this called for in many chowder recipes, but I think it's really a crucial ingredient. It really adds a nice little touch of sweetness to the chowder, which when combined with the smokiness from the bacon and the onions, the potatoes, the herbs, it really brings everything together. Doesn't really matter who goes when. We're gonna put this whole pint of cream and the whole can of evaporated milk into this. And you really wanna stir this constantly. You wanna use a spatula to try to break up any clumps that develop in there. The other addition to my chowder recipe that I only recently started using is I'm gonna hit this with just a touch of dry sherry. Not a lot, but a little bit of this is gonna go a long way. A little over a teaspoon of sherry. And that's gonna be hardly detectable in the chowder, but it gives it a real nice undertone, a little bit of sweetness. And last but not least, my secret ingredient. MSG, a little bit, I love this stuff. I put this shit in everything. A little bit of this goes a long way, maybe an eighth of a teaspoon. And that just really makes all the flavors come out, intensifies the flavors. So now we are on a crucial step. We are going to bring this to a boil. Once it's at a steady boil, we are gonna boil it for exactly one minute. No more, no less. Bring the heat up and we have all of our evaporated milk in there. We have all our cream in there. It's time to make the chowder happen. At this point, I've increased the heat. I'm on about medium high. And we're gonna wanna keep this moving constantly. And you're going to want to scrape the bottom of the pan as you get towards the end here you're going to get little clumps forming on the bottom you're going to want to mash those up on the side of the pot keep it as smooth as possible so you can see this consistency is still pretty thin but after this reaches a boil that is going to change uh, do we have bubbles we have bubbles i'm going to set my timer for one minute and now we need to really constantly stir this. I am not a scientist. I cannot explain how this magic works. But this is the base for a lot of recipes. It's actually my macaroni and cheese. I start out with the same process. All right, time's up. Just gonna keep stirring this for about another minute or two. It's gonna continue to thicken. All right, we are ready. We're gonna dump this into our chatter pot. Give the whole works a good stir. That's a nice consistency, not too thick, not too thin. Once everything is in the chatter pot, this is really where the magic happens. The longer this sits and melds and bubbles and combines, the better it gets. It's like a fine wine. I think a chowder is always better the next day. They improve with age. So we are now gonna turn off the heat, let all the flavors just snuggle up together in the pot. We're gonna let this sit and then we'll reheat it just before service. Ah, she's a fine pot of chowder. 
All right. Put a lid on it. Hi, Mom. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good you happy to see me with your dog side? Probably not. But I, close. I, yeah. I don't know which one you're having. Hi. You're having fish chowder today? Yeah. Have you ever had fish chowder? Not yours. All right. It's one of my specialties. Family cookbook. The family cookbook. Yes. This is Betty Crocker's cookbook. And when I went to college, it was the first year I lived off campus, you gave me this Betty Crocker cookbook. And you said, follow these recipes, you'll make some good food. And you said, don't buy any of that crap macaroni and cheese in the box. The recipe's in there for the good stuff. So I followed your directions. And you can see, and I must have made... Just like mine. Yeah. Like the macaroni and cheese right here. And this is my, my prize page for the... Which one's that? Turkey tetrazzini. Oh you can my. tell when See, the, I can make that without the recipe. I can right. now, but yeah, yeah I probably I made this 40 times. Yeah. And you can tell by that papyrus on this yeah. that that's a good it's recipe. A, it's a chocolate cake recipe, but you don't make cake, so. No, I'm not a baker. Cake You're cake the baker. <laughs> but that was one of the best gifts you ever gave me because I, I went to college. I saved a lot of money. I learned how to cook. I started cooking for my roommates. I'd sell them macaroni and cheese. I, everybody knew my macaroni and cheese. You can't buy these. I want them. No, it's a great cookbook. They need to reissue it. it. Yeah. So yeah, thank That's you for giving good. me Betty Crocker's cookbook. That was a great gift. And thank you for bailing me out of jail all those times and everything else. This <laughs> list is too long to to count everything. Oh, but I don't even want to remember those yeah. days. Betty Crocker cookbook. All right, we have more eaters arriving here. I'm not sure who we have. Do you have to go through this again with the dogs? Yes. What's up, Andy? Gentlemen. Hi, Andy. Hi. Hi. How's it going? It's going good. Welcome to Chowder Day. Chowder yeah. Day. Chowder? Oh, whoa. Day. Took a little spill here, buddy. What's up, Zach? What's going on, Andy? Uh, Anybody else coming? Yeah. Well, I, I think Ed G is so. coming. Oh, Ed's coming. Oh, Ed's coming. Yeah. All right, we are ready to serve up some chowder. We got some eaters. We got some guys from the office. We got Mom Nebreski here. We're going to serve up some chowder. Did you forget about those bacon bits? I did not. We're going to take those out of hiding and serve up some chowder. Ended my horizons in a dining room for sure. Well, if you had ever known what a horrible eater he was as a kid, he was probably like me. Yeah, he was. Yeah. For me, it was chicken nuggets, and that's pretty much what it ends. Yeah, but we think about what he was. All right, so we're going to garnish this with just a couple of thyme leaves, a little bit of fresh dill. And last but not least, bacon! Yes! Don't be shy with the bacon. Order up. All right, cheers oh, to cheers. fish chowder. Thank you. And to Tog. So Tog is the best. What would you say is second to Tog? Mm. Um, maybe Haddock. Tile fish would be a good one, although I've never done that. A little more bacon. <laughs> Help yourself, don't be shy. Yeah, why not? Bacon, bacon. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> bacon sprinkle. Can't go wrong. Have you ever done this with uh, clams or anything else? I do clam chowder the same way. Same way. I'm pretty, I'm 99% sure this recipe is on. Yeah, this will be a football Sunday meal that is going to yeah. be made with some yeah. Todd. Oh, yeah.